All right, let's wait for people to join in and then we can start. Uh, how come we hang on? The attendees are trickling in. We we'll probably wait for a few more minutes before we start. Okay, hang on. I don't know why we have. Um, hello to the attendees who are here. Uh, welcome to the webinar. Today we're discussing tackling consumption. Can we break the linear model? We have Adam Reed, who's the Chief Sustainability and External Affairs Officer at Sewers Recycling and Recovery, who's moderating the webinar. And he's going to talk to Jane Beasley, who was an experienced based and resources manager. She's a director at Beasley Associates Limited. We have Lorna Jackson, Research and Innovation Manager at Keep Britain Tidy, and Sarah Ottaway, who's a Sustainability and Social Value Lead at Suez Recycling and Recovery. So over to you, Adam. In the meantime, I'm going to figure out what is the problem with Zoom. Hi, Sweta. Thanks very much, and, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, it's nice to be back. It's been a while since I've done a, a Be Waste Wise webinar. Um, usually do four or five in a year, so this is the first for 2023, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here on a topic that is uh, ever more prevalent and important, I would suggest, because one planet living seems like a nice strap line, doesn't it? But actually it's reality. Um, if we can't get our resource consumption down, I don't care how good our recycling is. I don't care how good our decarbonisation technologies are. We have got a problem and it is coming fast. So today I've got some experts on the panel. Uh, gonna have a little look about how we break the linear model. Now don't get me wrong, I am a child of the 70s, which meant I was brought up on advertising and buying stuff. You know, stuff is good. So I'm trying to re-educate myself and my mum at the same time. That won't be the last time I mention her in a webinar. Um, but, you know, how do we do that without, A, impinging on people's, uh, you know, free will? But more importantly, how, how do we actually change the way that people see the world? And it's not just individual consumers, is it? It's, it's businesses. It's, it's all of the economic models that we've got. I mean, I, it was only the other week I was sitting down with, with HM Treasury, the government department responsible for, for all things economics in the UK. And they just looked at me blankly as if to say, why would we want to go on a circular economy journey, Adam? You know, surely we want to tax stuff when you make it and then tax stuff when you get rid of it. And that's how we, we fund services. And I was thinking we really do have to change the minds of a lot of people, not just my mum. So anyway, listen, audience, get your questions in. I've got a few poll questions to get you involved later on. But also if you've got good questions, rattle them in on the um, Q&A and then we can get the panelists working hard for you over the next 55 minutes. So first up, Jane Beasley, Dr. Jane Beasley. How are you, Jane? Are you well? Good, good, good. Now, Jane and I have worked together far too long. We did our PhDs in parallel, which is going back a long time, but um, we won't talk about that. But Jane's also done some work recently for Suez, um, looking at uh, consumption issues and how we can sort of start to nudge things in the right direction. So Jane, you're kicking off. Welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I will just share my screen. Okay. Can everyone see that? Is it coming? Yeah, it's coming through. Yep. Now. Yeah, the end of the slideshow though. Okay. Say something random. I'm go back to the beginning. Brilliant. Okay. So um, thank you very much, Adam. I'm just gonna dive straight in because I know we wanna get through lots of things and, and open the time for questions. I'm working from the premise that everyone is aware of the challenges that overconsumption causes and 
If we basically acknowledge that roughly 60 to 80 percent of impacts uh, on the planet come from household consumption, then obviously changing our consumption habits will have a drastic effect on our environmental footprint overall. The challenge we have is throughout the 20th and the 21st century, we have continued to work on an extraction basis. So we're extracting everything of value from the world around us for our own benefit. It's not equal. Um, it's certainly not equal globally and it's not equal across different economies. But our economic models have pretty much driven us to a place where we want more than what we need. And this is specifically the case in the Western world. And we're now in a situation where many of our products and services, they're deeply embedded within linear value change, which is a problem. Enjoyment, how we eat, how we move and how we invest our money. This is super challenging because the relationship that we have with products and possessions has pretty much become part of who we are and how we define ourselves. It's not our fault, as Adam said, children of the 70s, we will go back to Adam's mum at some point, but we do receive constant messaging to consume. They encourage us to consume 24 seven. So social media enables this to happen and all the different platforms that, that are out there allow us to kind of tap into the different psyche of different demographics, different age groups. And we know that the algorithms that we're facing now are increasingly more sophisticated and they pull in information and data all of the time on things that interest us, that our vulnerabilities uh, face, what our consumer habits in terms of what we buy and so on. So the marketplace is literally always open, which is a big challenge. It can also be super difficult to know what the right choice and the right behaviour is. So the space we're operating in is really noisy and the information can be really conflicting. We just need to look at greenwashing to understand the challenges that we're facing there. But we need to mainstream better consumer options. However, we define the better, whether it's more sustainable, whether we're slowing down consumption, but it's a better process at the moment in order to change our behaviours and change the model that we're working within. But doing so, the opportunity to change behaviour has to be present. It's not just about the knowledge and awareness of the challenges. It's key, but that can't work alone. It's not just about the willingness and the desire to do things differently. And it's also not just about availability and accessibility of alternative options and systems. Timing has to be right to bring everything into play but we can't wait for the perfect time. So it's about looking at how we can align all of the different things there, how we can align what's available, what's accessible, what's affordable and what's understood. And we also need to lose the expectation that it is in fact someone else's problem. So thinking about who can take the lead and drive this on. Actually, it's not just down to one particular group or one particular sector to break that chain. We do need collective action. We need to build a movement to come together. So change has to be in such a way that it empowers individuals, communities, businesses, policymakers to all play their part. And then the sum will be greater than the individual parts. And that's really difficult. And that's the challenge that we're facing in trying to break the linear model that we have at the moment. So looking first at government, we need policymakers who really are open to facilitating the changes required. They almost have to kind of set the scene and they need to have the vision and ambition to do so. Where you have populism and short term thinking in politics, so it makes it near one impossible to achieve. So that's number one challenge that we're facing here. Also, then you look at government on a local level. We've got competing demands across often overstretched uh, services, overstretched resources, definitely. So it's about what government can do to remove or lower some of the barriers to bring about behaviour change. And they can do this in lots of different ways. They can look at regulating product design. So we look upstream, we look at, at managing products before they even hit uh, the, the consumption pathway. We look at thinking about regulating choice editing. We think about product passports and enforcing a particular way of being and delivering. We look at fiscal incentives and targets. On a local level, you can look at licensing requirements, for example, at events. We can look at revenue and capital investments, promote diversification on the high street. So it's all about the kind of, challenge that you can bring in to address the norm. Right now, though, government can very easily channel their considerable public spending power through more sustainable procurement routes. So we talk a lot about sustainable procurement, but actually, it, you know, it's not embedded at all and it's not, it doesn't have the power it should have. How do we know this? Well, because we, we find cases of good practice and we celebrate them, which is fab, but it also means it's not the norm. We're highlighting and shining a light on those rather than saying this is business as usual. If we look at business, there obviously needs to be a motivation to change. Often this is driven by the consumer wants and desires. They will impact on the marketplace and the market will respond to those demands. 
for its by regulatory means, some of which I've highlighted. But businesses have to give meaningful choices, so there is an alternative. Clearly, there has to be a reason for them to do it. They have to satisfy shareholder needs and demands and so on. So often it's about rethinking their model of working. So think opposite of greenwashing. It's about mainstreaming service or resale models, for example, alongside traditional ownership routes. It's that transition. We've seen some high-end brands entering into the marketplace now offering clothing rental options. They didn't do this five years ago. Clothing rental options was niche. It might have been a children's clothes. It might have been a particular um, areas of business, but it certainly wasn't the high end of French connections of this world and so on. But we've seen them entering that arena. So there's obviously a demand for it and ask for it and a role for it. We've also seen more furnishing, IT uh, available on resale and rental services. And we're seeing that mainstreamed on the high street as well in, in, in general stores. Also last year, one high end department store made a public declaration that it wants half its interactions with customers to be based on resale, repair, rental, or refills by 2030. So that's quite a bold undertaking. And again, that's relatively new to the marketplace, but we're starting to see that transition. I think the other thing to note with businesses as well is the level of trust that we place in them. If anybody looks through the Endelman's Trust Barometer to Global Reports, well, the one that came out in 23 mirrors exactly the same as all of the other reports that have come out of the last five years. We don't trust government, but we do trust business. And actually we have an expectation for businesses to advocate on our behalf and to lead on climate change. So their role is not to be underestimated in all of this, that they can actually start to kind of really drive that direction because we place our trust in them over and above policymakers. For the consumers to get the change required at the scale that we need. So it isn't just the most informed or the most interested or the most concerned consumer. It's Adam's mum thinking about uh, choices that she makes on general buying. It's about buying less. It's about opting for reuse. It's about training to use refill opportunities so thinking ahead and planning uh changing the way you kind of shop change the way you decision make against your everyday activities it's about accessing apps that make sharing more accessible across different generations so not just the kind of generation said who are super used to it millennials and so on but all the way through to be at ease with that kind of platform it's about embedding the hierarchy of needs into our everyday life. So if you're not familiar with the hierarchy of needs, basically it's use what you have. It's if you can't use what you have, you borrow. If you can't borrow, you swap. If you can't swap, you thrift. If you can't thrift, you make very less resort is you buy. So it's a very different way of approaching how we think about things rather than a quick Amazon's online, it's gonna be delivered tomorrow. So in terms of signs of change, um, some would argue change is coming fast enough. Uh, things I've mentioned, some would say at a really small scale and won't make a difference. But I would argue that we are in a transition phase and we do need to gain some momentum in this space. And outside of those already committed, we need to start mainstreaming a more conscious consumer. And we need to enable that across all of the different partners. We need big team thinking. Um, the small wins that we have now really can start to communicate and can really build on the relative successes that we've got to lead us to be much more predisposed to taking the plunge in terms of the bigger things, things that seem more challenging, the things that seem more difficult. So individual our actions might be insignificant, but adopted at scale, well, they can make a difference. If we think back to the timing issue, you know, I'm an optimistic person generally. I believe that the signs are there that change is coming. The, we haven't had time to go into it, but there is a generational difference and there is a trend across how different generations are approaching the environment, social movement, economics and so on, how they view the world. And actually, the generations coming through will be taking the positions of authority. They will be the decision makers. They will be working in IT. They will be working in technology. Um, and they're much more predisposed to understanding actually what needs to be done. And they're much more predisposed to doing things differently and be prepared to be disruptive. They're not scared of it. Whereas in the meantime, I think we do have to celebrate uh, and demonstrate the small steps that we're taking, no matter how fragmented, no matter how disparate those steps might appear to be. But it's about that groundwork, the groundwork for transition and being open minded, I think, at this stage in the short term towards more of a fracturing uh, rather than a breaking of the linear model. And I've just put this stuff of life up there. If you haven't already seen it, haven't had a chance to go into the plethora of uh, examples of what we can do and what we're doing. So feel free to, to dig into that report if you want a bit more information. Thank you. Thank you, James. I love your optimism. Um, 
you're right. We do need to em- embrace and share those those small nuggets, those wins, because I think a win builds momentum. So thank you for that. And yes, the report's a good read. You you did a good job. Um, we thoroughly enjoy working with you on it. So um, uh, glad glad that you're sharing that too. Uh, what's your what's your one what's your one ask? What one thing do you need to change to make that jigsaw puzzle just work better? I think if you were sort of taking a helicopter view over it, and if we're looking as individuals, don't automatically think that what you can do won't matter or won't make a difference. So change, just changing one thing about how you address consumption, changing a conversation you might have, changing a demand on a brand or speaking to your MP or whatever. I, I think don't underestimate that. So don't keep quiet you know, really kind of speak out. It shouldn't just be small voices that are trying to shout really loudly about this. We should have collective action. I love that, Jane. Thank you. So there's your call to arms, everybody. Jane says, don't be quiet. And small change is good. So uh, on, onward and upward. Thank you. We'll come back to you, Jane, with some questions in due course. Let's move across to Lorna now. Now, Lorna, you've been doing your own research and you've got your own campaign happening. So tell us a bit, a little bit about Keeper and Tidy and what's been happening. Yeah, of course. Um, I'll just share my screen. I've got a couple of uh, of slides to, to go through. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, can you see that OK? All good. Um, so, so yeah, uh, as, as Sweta said at the beginning, I'm a research and innovation manager at Keep Britain Tidy, which is an independent charity here in the UK. Um, and we work to reduce litter, uh, but also we work around ending waste and improving public spaces as well. Uh, so I manage many of our uh, research projects, which delve deeper into the attitudes and behaviours and other factors uh, that are driving our issues. Uh, so, yeah, so as Adam said, I'm speaking today with a, a specific perspective from some recent research that we've conducted. Uh, and just published last month, uh, which I'll briefly tell you about now, and a campaign that we launched alongside it. Um, so I'll just go forward. Um, so this is our, our recent research report, uh, shifting the public's focus from recycling to waste prevention. Uh, so this research stemmed from the observation that we had that policy here in the UK has very much prioritised recycling above reduce and reuse uh, and that recycling is largely considered an established norm uh, but that there's no systematic tracking for engagement in waste prevention behaviours. We also recognise that when we speak to people and I speak to people in, in my research Uh, about the ways in which they can minimise waste and the the practical behaviours that they can engage in, they very quickly and typically default back to recycling. And it's very difficult to to move that conversation on. Um, And so this research questioned how we can better shift people up the waste hierarchy. And it focused specifically on individual behaviour change. Um, So we looked at this in more depth through uh, ethnography focus groups and some quantitative research. Uh, And I'll briefly mention some of the key insights that I've I've noted here, but we've got the full report on our website if you're interested in looking into that. Um, So yeah, so the first sort of key point here that I've noted is that most people engage in something we consider to be waste prevention behavior. Uh, but that this is not necessarily extensive. So they might be doing something very well, but there's still lots they're not doing. Um, So none of the waste prevention behaviours we uh, tested as part of our research could be considered at that established norm level, which we're saying is is around nine and 10 people, as, as is the figure for those engaging in recycling. Um, And reuse behaviours such as repair and uh, renting were were particularly low as well. Um, But it was positive that uh, where people do engage in a waste prevention behaviour, they tended to do it relatively uh, consistently as if that's uh, a habit that's informed and it becomes part of their their life and and their their lifestyle, which is positive. 
Uh, so the second point there is um, that people associated waste more with what they throw away than what they buy. So we know uh, through this finding that many communications that use the term waste aren't always having the impact that we want them to. So people hear the term waste and they're thinking of end of use, they're thinking of disposal, they're not thinking of their, their consumption. And so uh, we've, we need to frame communications perhaps differently to shift that focus towards consumption and away from uh, disposal and, and throwing away. Um, and similarly, when it comes to thinking about their environmental impacts, uh, people are focused on the impact of throwing things away uh, rather than having the thing in the first place. So rather than thinking of the resource use going into producing that item, they're, they're thinking of the impacts of, of them, you know, wherever it ends up after they've finished with it. Um, and then finally, the key insight I've noted there was that people tend to think of wasting better rather than wasting less. So by this, we mean that people often see recycling as the very best thing that they can do to prevent waste. Um, and as well as that, the, the ability to be able to recycle an item can in some instances actually justify consumption. So we asked people about this and almost a third of people said that uh, as long as an item or its packaging is recyclable, I, I don't feel bad about buying it. Um, so, you know, that there is a challenge there in, in, in how we address that. Uh, and then there's a, an interesting quote I've, I've just put there from one of our participants about how um, you know, recycling is, is thought about. Um, so we want to encourage individuals to rethink their consumption and shift the narrative from what we throw away to what we buy and help to strengthen that link between um, that people make between their consumption and its environmental impact. Um, so we started, shift, there we go. Uh, so we started with our... Uh, Buy Nothing New Month campaign, uh, which this very busy slide illustrates. Um, so this was a digital campaign that we ran in January this year, uh, encouraging participants to buy nothing new for one month. Uh, so it aimed to try and do some of these things that we feel need to, need to be done. It aimed to celebrate and signpost to and increase awareness and demand for the reuse and repair and renting services that, that we do have available already. Um, and also to begin to try and normalize avoidance. Um, so that, that's what we aim to do here. Um, and we're currently pulling together an evaluation of, of the impact of this campaign. And we are looking to, to run it for, for a second year. Um, so this is the, the sort of direction that, that, that we that we'd love to see and, and be working in uh, further. Um, so yeah, so that's a bit of background from me. I'll hand back to you, Andrew. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Lorna. It's fascinating. I mean, it's, it's great that you, a, you've got some, you know, you've done some research and I love the focus groups and yeah, why is it that people think recycling is the answer to climate change? I'll tell you what the answer is to that. Well, they've spent the last 25 years being told recycling is the answer to absolutely everything. You know, there was exactly. a time when, when you couldn't, couldn't move on TV for advertising about recycling being good and recycling the possibilities are endless and, uh, you know, all of those campaigns that some of us can remember so well. And, and, I, and I think in the ab absence of other messaging about the upper echelons of the hierarchy and the fact that policymakers, it's not only here in the UK, you know, policymakers around the world have gone, mm, waste prevention, that's a bit hard. That's measuring nothing. Um, not sure I can justify putting effort into measuring nothing. And equally, I don't want to stop consumers consuming because they might not vote for me. So I think it's, it's really interesting how we've suddenly created a bunch of consumers who now think the answer is recycling when actually we know that the hierarchy is far, far more than that. So, I mean, instinctively, you know, you've got the evaluation to come, but that campaign looked great. But was it? you know headlines what, what do you think I mean are, are people resonating with it is it is it making a difference I think it's an extremely difficult ask of people even for one month you know it is it is a massive challenge and 
like like Jane was saying, we we very much are aware that this needs to come along with a whole host of other factors to support people to be able to do this. I, th I think what's good about it is uh, to try and just, e even if it can encourage people to rethink their consumption in any small way, that that's a win, you know. In our evaluation so far, I've, I've heard people say, well, uh, I, uh, I failed because I had to buy a replacement, you know, whatever electronic item. And it's like, well, that it's, it's not a fail because that person obviously has been trying to rethink what they need versus what they want. And and I think that's that's a great starting point. But absolutely, it needs to come with the, the wider framework to support that person. That's good to hear. And I think you're absolutely right, because there is so much here about system as well, isn't there? It's all well and good if I know I need to do something. But if then if it's too hard to do something, eventually people will just give in and go time is money um, or, or slip into old habits because they are hard to break. So thank you for that. Fantastic. So two two big picture um, campaign agendas there. Now, finally, uh, my colleague in arms, Sarah Ottaway. Good morning. Good morning. How, How are you I'm all right. I'm all right. How's how's the world of waste managers and waste prevention that doesn't seem to ring very nicely off the tongue does it? <laughs> it it doesn't when you put it like that but i think we're getting a much better view about what our what our role is and the opportunity that we have to really influence our system too which hopefully brings me on to uh, a couple of slides to share with everyone today so let me just share my screen there we go hopefully that's all up on everyone's screen now Nodding heads, good, that's all right then. Phew. There's that moment where everybody goes, who's going to nod first? Um, so yeah, so hello everyone. Um, so yeah, I think it's really important just to start off uh, as a reminder that consumption is a global issue. Obviously we're talking a lot about the UK here because of the nature of where we're all sat, but um, there's, a, there's a huge link. Everything that we buy, no matter where, where we are in the world, is linked to this global economy that we are all a part of. And we know that in terms of uh, climate change, you know, the IP. IPCC, for example, have specified that the way we produce and consume items globally have direct links with climate change. It is there is scientific evidence that links all of this up now. I think a really good way that illustrates this uh, every year is Earth, Earth Overshoot Day. I can't say words there. Um, this year it's a day earlier, it's July 27th for the entire world. That's where we surpass the resources that we've used beyond what the earth can replenish in that time. And that's getting earlier and earlier every year. It took a little step back because of COVID, but it's rapidly increasing again. Um, and I, I always really like this graphic because it shows the, the differences in how we consume across the world. So if we lived like Qataris or those living in Luxembourg, we already would have surpassed the, uh, the resources that the earth could replenish. And at the total other end of the scale, we have countries that are not even on this list. Because, you know, on average, people across those countries are living below that global ecological capacity. You know, countries, India, Nigeria, Sri Lanka, all are rapidly developing nations that are growing in, in their wealth and their economic development. And, you know, if they continue, if they continue to develop and they choose the same lifestyles as those on this screen, they're going to end up on this on this as well and that that will just add to it so i think today as much as very much what we're talking about is very uk focused the principles are still very relevant across no matter where you are sat right now in in the world the application may look quite different but the principles and the need to tackle consumption and to consume differently are still really important uh, no matter where you are so coming back to uh resources and waste sector which is where i'm sat in terms of what what i do uh, every day as is uh, my colleagues uh, joining me um right now but what role should the sector be playing you know i think that ultimately we pick up stuff we move it somewhere else and we make sure the right thing happens to it so how can we really influence what's going on and i think there's kind of three key areas around this one is that ultimately we're the custodians of resources you know once a member of the public whether they're at work or at home decided they don't want these things anymore we then become those custodians to make sure that they uh, end up in the right place and that's where that circular economy and the principles around it are so important because our systems need to be designed need to consider pushing everything as in this example as close to the middle of that uh, that circular economy as we possibly can or up the waste hierarchy depending on which graphic you like to use uh, and it's with all that considered and in mind so that we can help and ensure people make good decisions because ultimately coming back to Lorna's point and the and her and what she covered this is about the decisions that we make every day and the easier we make it for people to make the right decision through the services that we provide the more likely they are to make it uh, and put things in the right place or not use it in the first place which obviously what this is all about 
And ultimately, the future of our services, because of all of this, are not about fleets of trucks and emptying bins and running big stations, you know, uh, transfer stations where heaps of waste or recycling gets tipped off. It will be about, as you can see from the picture on the screen, about taking items and turning them back into something new or making sure that we have refill systems so we don't need to produce packaging or it's a refillable packaging that can be refilled and used time and time again. So there's less need uh, for the overall consumption that we have right now. But there's also about influencing policy. I think that's something where sewers in particular, we've played a really big role in talking about what the opportunities are when it comes to these different approaches to how we use and consume every day. You know, we've spent a lot of time, you know, I've worked for Adam now for nearly four years. Poor Adam, he did have hair when he started. Um, <laughs> true story. And, uh, you know, through that time, you know, so much of what sewers has been doing and before that as well, is about showing politicians, showing decision makers the opportunities that come with looking at things slightly differently. Just because it's the way we've done it before doesn't mean it's the way we have to do it in the future. The picture on there is of our reuse hub, which if you've come to any um, sewers webinar or event or anything that we've produced recently, we talk about the hub locks. We're incredibly proud of this 6,000 square foot space that is redefining how we manage and handle resources and how we can put them back into use through repair, through um, upcycling and how we do that using and working with uh, social enterprises and other organizations that can uh, create opportunities for others to come and learn and really benefit from those experiences too and actually when you bring MPs and decision makers into that space they can really see with their you know with their eyes right in front of them what you know what the opportunities are by redefining how we manage uh, manage our resources and it's also about finding evidence around this as well it's all nice to have examples but it's about having evidence and having data to really support what we're saying and that's why we you know we commission reports and share the data that we gather every day hence why we work with Jane in terms of that sustainable consumer report to demonstrate actually you know in the in the written word or through data that actually what that this is entirely possible with the right decisions and the right policies in place to to push us all in the right direction uh, so ultimately the resource in the waste sector we shouldn't underestimate the role we can and should be playing you know we see the world differently you know we are those custodians of resources we're a barometer of the economy when gdp goes up so does the waste that we produce you know we are the window into the public's consumption habits and as jane said and just to reiterate her point that we need to make our voices heard and that's a really important role that we should be playing and uh, on that i'll pass back to you Heather. thanks sarah uh, the, the rumor is not true i didn't have hair when when i started managing <laughs> her um brilliant thanks and, and you know, look you know you and i work closer together so of course we we sound like we're on the same hymn sheet but absolutely you know the future of, of waste management is resource management and actually it's not just recycling which is what some of our peers might talk about but it's actually helping our customers both you know municipal but also industry to recognize the value of the material that they might have they just might have it in the wrong format or in the wrong place or at the wrong time and our job is to help kind of undo that conundrum a little bit so so thank you for that right brilliant panelists excellent thank you my question for you though sarah i've got to have a question for everybody isn't it? um I, I suppose is the we we see a lot of politicians we see a lot of policy makers you know uh, civil servants if you like how you talked about data you talked about evidence I, do you think we can win the war? Do you think we can convince them that, that this sea change of policy is actually deliverable and in the interests of UK PLC? I think if we didn't, we probably all would have stopped and have gone home by now, um, <laughs> if I'm honest. But yeah, we can, we're seeing that. You know, I think um, one of the examples I put on my, my slide was, the, uh, was flexible packaging. Not quite uh, consumption, but more around the recycling angle. But by actually having those discussions with DEFRA, with uh, other stakeholders that are part of that value chain. And actually we think that collecting flexible packaging from householders will work. Now it's part of the consistent collections agenda. We're just waiting for that final confirmation, but it was part of the previous consultation round. So yes, absolutely, we know that they're listening. It's just about helping them to put all the pieces together to not feel threatened. I think some of the bigger challenges are where it comes to that economic side. So, you know, talking to the likes of the treasury when they're going actually people need to buy stuff because that's how we make money there's those bigger challenges but absolutely we can we can see where we're making those inroads um like i say i think if we didn't then we'd uh, we'd all have shut up shop by now i'm loving the optimism that the three of you are uh, are sharing today <laughs> who, who knew it could be so good <laughs> just just over the horizon right uh, i'm gonna ask a poll question in a minute but um i've got a couple of really good questions coming first so let's let's pick the first one Quick, a quick question for the panelists. Surely it's simple. I'm paraphrasing, by the way. Um, why aren't governments globally setting a resource production 
reduction target, something that says reduce by X percent, let's say, by sector. You know, why are we not? Why is nobody doing that? Uh, Jane, what's stopping them? Lots of things. Um, I mean, just to set aside from the fact that it's not an equitable situation that we're facing here. Um, so a global response, I don't think is appropriate. Also, setting targets like that, super challenging um, in terms of how you define them, where you set the limit, one person's view, etc. I actually think, to flip it, because we're in the optimistic mode here, I think product stewardship is more of a way forward with this, where we can target much more specifically on a product by product basis, and we can make sure the whole of the value chain um, is considered. And we go further than EPR, you know, we can bring in that prevention, we can bring in the reuse. So I think that would be a better way of addressing it. Thank you. And and Lorna, sort of on the same theme, would it just be simpler to look at what we've done with carbon and go, well, if you can set carbon targets at a global level and you can set them at a national level and then every sector of the UK has now got a decarbonisation target, surely we could just do the same for resource consumption? I mean, maybe. <laughs> I, think, uh, I, think, I think it's very difficult and I think it just doesn't fit alongside the other messages we're all receiving around around asking us to consume i think there's a there's a disparity there and and it's for consumers very very confusing if we're if we're being asked to reduce and uh and 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 th and therefore what what's the motivation for for those goals to be set if we're also wanting to consume yeah, my mum's the benchmark and she is confused. Even, even like with a pro professor of waste management as a son, she's still confused. Yes, Sarah, of course you can. Thank you. Just, just to come back on both Jade and Lorna's points, I think one we do have in the UK, we've got residual waste targets now in terms of halving residual waste by 2040. I forget the last bit of that date, but, you know, in some 42, thank you. <laughs> you wouldn't have thought I did history as a degree. Terrible at remembering dates. Um, so obviously that's the other side. So I agree with Jane completely, but we've got the other side of that as well in terms of that systemic change. And, and go back to Lord's point, absolutely. And this is where we need the systems to encourage the right behaviours. I think we can ask the public to change as much as we want, but if the systems keep working against them, we're going to be continuing that uphill battle. So those two things need to come on together. Okay, so I'm going to ask the next question because it's you, you've taken the debate on a little bit here about systemic change and also about language. There's a little bit of language in here. So good question coming from uh, from a friend friend of the uh, of the organisation, Perva. Um, she's interested in language, uh, particularly business language, and and whether or not you know is there a lack of skills? Is there a lack of understanding? Is there a lack of consistency in the way that we talk about some of this stuff that's actually preventing businesses from moving forward as fast as perhaps some of us think they could? We'll start with you, Jane. Um, I think there is an, an issue with knowledge to start with, particularly in SMEs. And I think we need to ensure that there's that basic level of awareness of it, what it is we're asking, what it is we're talking about before we move into what skills are required to address it. I think SMEs are the biggest sort of challenge area and we need to shift it. So, you know, we need to get it into that kind of health and safety zone. We need to get it to be a basic requirement across businesses. And that will that drive will only come from a regulatory position to say, this is what you must do um, and enforce that. Because what if you're an SME, who cares? You know, you, you're basically doing your day job. You might have quite a turnover staff are generally stretched. You don't have somebody whose role it is to look at circular economy or to look at, you know, climate change and so on you can't afford it so it needs to be built in a different way and it starts with knowledge i think first that's very sombering um I, I mean i think what's interesting i think about recycling and those of us that are old enough to remember you know the recycling boom took a while to gather some momentum did it not you know there's a lot of people fighting it going oh the quality's rubbish like you know there was no desire for for the products and even what do i put out and when was confusing and, and I think it took 20 odd years before most people got it right most of the time. And even now you might argue. So I'm just wondering, is, is changing consumption, Lorna, just more complicated than changing recycling behaviour? And actually, it's going to take more than 20 years to get most people to do it right. I mean, potentially, I guess the, the, the main difference is that it's a whole host of behaviours and waste prevention and reducing consumption means 
different things to different people and how they ingrain that in their lives is it is is so different for everyone so for us for trying to communicate about that it is extremely complex and therefore for that to uh, end up in a behavior change at the end of it it, it is is very difficult um we're, we're quite interested in the use of a, a perhaps a consumer facing version of the waste hierarchy i mean we've sort of tested that, this very lightly um, and it seems like a very useful vehicle for communicating this and how where recycling fits within the story of all these wider behaviours that people could adopt. Um, and so I think there's there's lots more to un unpick there in terms of the language and the communications and, and how it's framed. But uh, absolutely, you know, it is it's a massive challenge, isn't it? I like the idea of a, of a consumer facing hierarchy that um, that's, that's came up in some of our conversations Jane and Sarah didn't it when we were talking about the report of course so probably very timely right uh Twitter let's let's get a, a, a poll question up and running I I'm 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 a because I'm interested in what the the panel I've got to say let's go with the first one the one about reducing consumption we must uh audience just vote it's a simple one to reduce resource consumption we must and you can only pick one of these so is it change the regulatory framework I think that's what Jane was saying and my words, set rigid targets. Uh, two, motivate consumers to buy differently. You've heard a bit of that from, um, from Lorna there. Uh, is it upskill repairers and designers to make reuse happen? That picks up on the question from Perver a little bit. It's the skills base and it's the appreciation of other people in the sector. Or is it, these are my words, tax virgin materials and externalities like carbon, i.e. make this stuff cheaper than buying rubbish? My words, not yours. Right, vote and we'll come back to it. Um, Go on in, Jane. What's um? If you were in the uh, in the audience, what would you be voting? We've only got one. Um, I'd vote for the I'd vote for number one, the change the regulatory framework, but not necessarily the step into but, markets bit. But, but but not on its own, probably. But that's the one that would not on its own. But yeah, yeah. that's what I'd go for. Lorna. Uh, yeah, I'm trying not to sit on the fence here because I want to select <laughs> select select all of the above option. Um, yeah, but I, I do I I agree. It's it, it is a lot about the the framework uh, that sits and then ev everything else can sort of sit on, underneath that because without the right regulatory framework it's only ever going to be voluntary action and all the other stuff might be nice to have but might not pay for itself so mm -hmm. okay sarah are you are you on the same lifeboat as the other two or no i'm going to go on the party boat of uh, tax virgin materials and externalities because i think this that drives systemic change the reason that we've seen for example the plastics tax here in the uk start to change the uh, recycled content even before the tax the tax came in was because companies could see what was coming and saw that there uh, there was a need to change because their packaging wasn't going to meet that regulation so i think as long as it was done in the right way and as you pointed out going through the questions that it made uh, the uh, the right option the cheaper option oh. not just you know a cheap toaster alternative yep. um then it could it could probably exceed and probably move faster than a regulatory framework could do thank you I, and, and interestingly I, I i don't like saying i like tax because i don't before hm Treasury thinks I do. Um, but um, but I do think there is something quite clear about, you know, the landfill tax historically, the plastic tax. There's something that, that's very black and white about taxation that kind of and businesses get it and consumers get it. You know, they, they can see that there's a pricing differential. The, the issue is being transparent, I think, is why is there a bigger tax here than this one? And if you then know, well, that's because there's pollution associated with its manufacturer here, there or, or wherever, or because the cost of them managing it post consumer is significantly higher, then I think that becomes an educational tool as much as anything else. What, what was the uh, what was the scores on the doors? Sweater? What, there we go. 44 percent stick some tax on it. 22 percent regulatory framework and 33 percent. Let's get into motivating consumers thank you audience let's ask another one while i'm while i'm on a roll here so let's go with number two because i'm interested in who benefits this is always a, an issue of inertia when it comes to why should we change so who benefits most so there's there's the key word here most from tackling the consumption issue is it the planet is it the new green economy that's going to spawn out of all of these new services that we provide is it charities um is it communities you can't vote all lorna sorry um i've, I've taking that option out of the equation so go on in audience vote Laura which one would you go for you've only got one vote which one mm. who benefits most 
I mean, I, I think uh, I was I was going to say the planet because that's the ultimate that's the ultimate uh, you know goal goal here with some of this. But I, I think communities are um, a, a huge a huge beneficiary for for all of this. You know, I was thinking about the the reuse hub um, and examples like this where uh, circular models are working so so well and they're benefiting having so many benefits but ultimately they're providing jobs for the communities they're providing communities with affordable repaired goods that they can buy you know I, I think I think I would select that cool let's see what the scores and the doors are switch I, I think my perspective on this one is that depending on where you're sitting and what and how you see the world I think that everybody wins but you know the particular uh, flavor of the month will be will be obvious so what do we got there was that 56 percent uh say communities there we go very good uh 33 percent the planet there's the right answer uh no percent charities so we've obviously got the wrong audience on the um on the call today but you know interesting thing what do you think sarah i mean is that what what you would have picked um no i think i well i think it is one of those you'd have all of the above wouldn't you you know if we were that option it would have been 100 percent that i think that was probably a given but i think the in order for this to work, the green economy has got to be the, the big winner because, again, that's where you bring the decision makers, you bring those who uh, need to drive the systemic change on board by using that as your uh, front message and that being the big winner because then everyone else in those categories benefits as a result of that leading the way. Okay, let's go. With, I've got one. Go on, let's have another poll question. We're on a roll now. Come on, audience, you're doing well. Uh, and then I'll go back to the question. So, Sweta, launch number three, please, because I'm really interested in the kind of dichotomy here between Jane and Lorna a little bit because we've got to change consumer behavior we need to a work on everyday activities one step at a time which is I, I think is is more of Lorna and, and what Keep Britain Tidy have been working on or is it to look at those life-changing moments when a new norm can be created a new job you've just had kids you've just moved house which is a little bit I think Jane some of the things you looked at in in the stuff of life so audience is it is it a or is it b is it small stuff and lots of it or is it the big ticket items that build the new norm um Jane go on put in a, a, a case for your it's the big life-changing moments yeah I mean we looked at scenarios we tested different things uh within the stuff of life and I think because you are changing something in your life that's the pause and reflect moment so it was potentially easier the new job you might think how am I going to get there you might look at your kind of transport decisions you might look at your work wardrobe going through something like vintage um you might be moving house and thinking about you know maximizing reuse not just getting rid of your stuff and putting it in a skip all those type of things conversely you might just strip the whole thing and just go for mass consumption but it's the kind of pause reflect moments that I think almost easier for you to have those life decisions Okay. What did the what did the audience say, Sweater? Show us the scores on the doors. Lorna, I'm coming in your direction. 63% everyday activities one step at a time. Looks like you got this one, Lorna. So tell me what 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 are those top two or three small examples that you think everybody could leave this call and just go and do a bit better? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think understanding what what it is that you uh need versus what you want and and beginning to re reduce um the that desire and question that desire to consume i mean that it's so difficult but there's lots of small actions that we can all take like turning off uh subscription emails to all these favorite shops and notifications like little little things to question your your own consumption um and being more aware of that uh, is fantastic and then the, there are there are the services that we can begin to to use that you know many people won't be aware of but there's there are things out there um like like renting models and, and reuse models that that we can shift to I, i'm interested in the sort of in in between as well like there might be uh points throughout the year that we could begin to target like like obviously january is the start of a new year where people might be forming new habits start of september when kids are going back to school maybe that's a time to target so maybe there's an in-between there as well i like that as a hybrid model um there's some good questions coming in as well at the moment we've, we've got the audience buzzing um so sarah if if it's going to repairing an electrical item is the question in mind but if it's going to be 30 percent or more of the cost of the item then people are just going to go and buy a new one so this break this tipping point for when something becomes 
repairable affordably let's call it Mm -hmm. versus let's just go and buy a new toaster um it's all about economics so you know are the audience almost crying for more more tax is that is that what is that are you getting a feeling a sense of feeling that actually your your taxation model is actually going to win out the day here that we, (laughs) we, we need to make it more expensive to buy toasters is what the audience are telling me we do but also we've got to make it cheaper to repair those items that are coming through you know we need the the products to be accessible we, it needs to be simple so that a toaster can be repaired and i think we can you know there's also the wider networks around this as well you know it's having the right um right <coughs> approach that's accessible for that item it might be something really small like a, i don't know like a element in a kettle for example that either someone can do themselves so they need to be able to get hold of that part really easily um, or they can take it to someone locally um, or it might even be a repair cafe you know we have those out there which is those you know wonderful community enterprises that are really bringing repair to the fore Um, you know it doesn't have to be the sole um, uh, sole area that business operates in this can this is a multifunctional uh, system that we'll we'll have operating Um, and it's about having helping people to understand when to make that right choice. But the system has got to be easy. And this is what it's all going to come back to. We've been sold convenience for the last 20 years, along with recycling, we've been sold convenience. It's got to be in the most convenient way possible. So so there's a couple of things there. One, you almost advertise a a webinar that I'm chairing in in a few days' time looking at at repair that you're speaking on. So that was almost a plug. So I've done it now. Two, you talk about convenience, though. And I think it's fascinating. We all lived through lockdown, didn't we? Yeah. I've never been inundated with so much spam on my email since lockdown because I was buying stuff online that I never used to buy before. Um, and I, and I kind of think, yeah, actually what I need is an idiot's guide coming back to Lorna's point. I, I need people to help me switch stuff off. So where's the advisory group or where's my, you know, quick fit, you know, phone number that solves my problems here. Cause that's, you know, I'm just average consum- consumer, aren't I? I need to be given some really simple tools to help me switch off, that traffic or to you know in, disengage myself from from some bad habits that you know that, that came through through a difficult time right um somebody's asking here about normalizing the behaviors that we want to see and i'm just thinking covid normalized a whole heap of other behaviors which is probably what i just alluded to so uh, can can we normalize waste prevention lorna is that is that that's the intention to keep it entirely work isn't it to normalize sort of uh, n- reduce consumption type type activities but i mean how long is it going to take to normalize yeah. This is generational, isn't it? I mean, I think so. I think I think the journey perhaps can start with beginning to celebrate more the fantastic examples that are happening now and shining a light on great practice and increasing the dialogue around what, what's already happening and trying to push that through the noise of everything else, else. That, that that we're exposed to. Um, so I, I think that's that's p- part of it of of creating that that normal social norm cool i I wonder we we spent literally millions over several years trying to normalize recycling behavior in the uk lots of marketing campaigns lots of advertising um lots of local flavored stuff as well as national campaigning i'm just wondering jane what is the budget needed to normalize resource consumption in a more sustainable way and how long is that campaign going to have to run and actually who should drive that campaign because now we've got tiktokers and social media influencers and you know we didn't have that really at at our hands when we were trying to make recycling the norm point i also don't think you can apply just a blanket campaign approach like we did with recycling i think it's product specific so we are seeing normalization in some areas. So for example, we are seeing the slow fashion movement now growing immensely. And that's been driven by the generation sets who are really happy to buy secondhand goods. And there are so many different apps out there where they will buy and they will buy secondhand goods that they know will have a resale value too. So there's economic savviness happening there as well. So it's feeding a consumption habit that they have, but feeding it in a different way. So I think clothing is is heading in that direction. And I thread up, I know it's focused on the States, but their recent report has shown massive, massive growth on secondhand sales. And that predominantly is seen as super accessible over and above buying, say, sustainable fashion. So, you know, that's a kind of downside, I guess, for those companies who are trying to position themselves in that space. But secondhand is is not seen uh, as second best. I think other things like phones, you know, that leasing model, the second hand leasing model gives you that security, which goes back to the repair question and what can you afford and 
you know, what's the ratio of spend? If you lease a secondhand phone for a year from Music Magpie, for example, other supplies are available, um, then they will guarantee it. And then at the end of that 12 months, they will we'll look at it, they'll replace it, you'll get another secondhand model. So it's 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 opening the kind of doors and it's it's shouting about stuff like that. And it's tapping into cost of living crisis massively because we can't alienate, you know, lots of the things we talk about, we, we look at, they're great for middle classes. Um, and we can all tap ourselves on the shoulder and go, brilliant, we've all got a job and we can afford to do that. But we do have to normalise it. And my final point, I guess, comes back to that regulatory framework. Somewhere like France, you know, they've put in that the, the re refill requirement um, in a supermarket over a certain floor space, whatever. It's not the norm here. Refill comes and goes and it's quite sort of focused in certain types of shops. And it's not it's not side by side where you're doing all your other shops. That's where it has to come through. So it's about advertising, promoting, shouting about those things. And TikTokers, you are right, are literally key to this. Those social media influencers who have taken this as their kind of gamut and their sort of area of focus, they're, they're fundamental to this moving forward. Wow. Thank you. I did have a poll question I was going to ask, which is about social media and influencers, but I'm not going to ask it, Sweta. I'm conscious of time. And actually, we've had a really good answer there. So I'm, I'm going to ask each of the panellists just for a... Uh, a quick reflection on, on, on the takeaway messages for today. Um, if I was uh, giving you a hashtag and I was going to put something on social media in a moment, what would it be, Lorna? Um, oh, put me on the spot there. Yeah, so I, uh, I think beyond recycling, I think that's, that's mine. I think that sums up the sort of messages from, from what we know. Hashtag beyond recycling. I like that. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today, by the way. Good luck with the uh, campaign evaluation. And I look forward to seeing a bigger campaign next year. Uh, Jane, what's your takeaway? Hashtag, please. OK, my state, I have, I have two. My not optimistic one, because it is collaborative action. It will be collaborate or die. But that's not very positive one to finish on. So I'm going to say no step too small. Hashtag no step too small. Thank you. It's been a pleasure having you on virtual stage with me today um and no doubt we'll see you soon and then finally sarah you knew it was coming what's your hashtag well i rethought mine to be honest considering what we've talked about today so uh, i rethought mine to to hashtag uh, the price is right <laughs> hashtag the price is right <laughs> and for those of you old enough to remember that game show it was all about consumerism um, but that's a good line to end on. It's better than saying hashtag carbon tax. Um, so I, we'll, we'll, we'll let you have that one. Um, listen, all, uh, panel, you've been fantastic. Thank you. Lots of insight. Unbelievable amount of work going on in this space, which I think hopefully the audience are picking up on. Don't be shy. Don't be a stranger. Go and see what's going on. Talk to these individuals. They're easily searchable. If you want to know where they are, just email me and I'll, I'll pass on their details. Um, get involved, I think, was the call to arms from the beginning of the session, wasn't it? Um, don't let your voice not be heard. Um, so join, you know, join the campaign. Get involved. Uh, do some lobbying, whether it's your local MP or you want to lobby government or a big brand. There's, there's plenty of opportunity going on right now for us to go beyond recycling uh, and to make you know a different consumption model uh, more of a, rea a reality for things perhaps like electricals and clothing as, as Jane rightly alluded to so um, thank you audience thank you for answering the questions taking part in the polls and raising some good questions I apologize not for not answering the final one that came in with three minutes to go but hey we're running out of time um, but I will pass that one on to everybody else um, sweater I'm sure you want to advertise uh, a forthcoming Be Waste Wise webinar of some description or other. So I'm going to hand the floor back to you. I've been your chair. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm Dr. Adam Reed, and I will see you soon. Thank you, Adam. And thanks a lot to the other speakers as well. Thanks for the hour. We went by pretty quickly. And uh, to the audience, we have a webinar this week. We have one on marine litter, which is focused on Latin America. So please head to our website. You will be, or you know, head to our social media, LinkedIn, you'll be able to find a link to it. Please go ahead and sign up over there. This webinar will be up on our website in two weeks. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Cheers, everyone. Thank you.